In this episode, I speak to Gary Ross about building relationships with the C-suite. Gary shares that there is more than having a seat at the table. We must be strategic advisors. We also discuss the need to leverage your expertise and exactly how you do this. It is a great conversation to help you understand the C-suite and how you can communicate better with them. I create clear thinking and decisive leaders who can amplify their influence. Contact me to find out how I can help you or your organisation. And today our guest is Gary Ross. Hi, Gary. Hi, Judith. How are you? I'm good. What about you? I am doing really well. Do you like dancing, Gary? Do I like dancing? Hmm. Well, um, I like watching other people dance. (laughs) Does that count? (laughs) And what kind of dancing? Like the whole kind of freestyle or waltzing or tap or what? What, what's your thing? Well, I I just anybody who's a professional dancer, I that that just blows me away with what they're what they're able to do. Um, When it comes to me dancing, I generally don't like to inflict that on other people. Um, (laughs) So (laughs) (laughs) that's funny. I recently saw uh, a a YouTube video of a 94 year old man and 91 year old woman and they were dancing like they were 20. It was unbelievable to watch. That is that is amazing. It was. It was just like, whoa. (laughs) But anyway, tell us about you, Gary. Well, so I'm a a workplace communication trainer and coach, and I work with people from the C-suite to the production line to to help people communicate better at work and show up professionally and help people inform and persuade and influence when they when they communicate. That sounds fantastic. I'm curious, though, what's your definition for professional? It would be where you're uh, where you're you're showing up for the environment that you're in, recognizing the the environment and expectations of not only your clients, but potential and potential clients, as well as your organization as well. And 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 providing that and, and showing up in such a way where you're where you're exuding confidence and knowledge and you're also communicating in such a way that respects other people's time and and attention. Brilliant. I like that because the reason I was asking because I I have this conversation of what is professional quite a lot with the senior leaders that I mentor. Um, and sometimes people read professionalism to mean avoidance of conflict, which is not the same thing. No, and and I I would agree with that, and I, I would also add that sometimes people confuse professionalism with with trying to sound different than what you are, uh, trying to sound more formal or more complex, or so almost a, a faux intellectualism uh, that the situation doesn't call for, or that is just outside of what you you normally are. So a lot of times people feel that they're communicating professionally, but they're just being inauthentic. And then they start using big puffy words that don't really mean anything. And all of a sudden we're talking about leveraging new paradigms to implement best in class solutions to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And and we're not really saying anything anymore. So but, there, yeah. there are ways. Yeah. So there are ways to, you know, to your point, I think people sometimes take that, that professional um, communicating professionally and and it gets skewed a little bit. I think the core of communicating professionally, like I like I said uh, a moment ago, is communicating in a way where where you're you're able to inform and persuade and and influence when you when you know your audience and you're respectful of their of their time and attention, and you're also understanding the, a little bit of their frame of mind as well and their daily work life that they're being bombarded with all this other communication. Uh, as well, so you find you're finding ways to to rise above and be clear and uh, and and get in and get out essentially. Yeah, and it's a bit frustrating when you yourself use those kind of this is a paradigm shift because you mean it is a paradigm shift. But so you understand what you're saying and you're describing something accurately, but then that kind of language gets misused by people who don't know what they're talking about. And then it makes it look like you're not you're not sure. There's a bit, you know what I mean? 
<laughs> right, exactly. Instead of saying we're going to leverage a new paradigm, we're just say, hey, we're going to look at doing things in a new way. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, you're talking like a human being <laughs> uh, in, instead of uh, instead of a lot of this corporate gobbledygook that that we encounter so often. OK, so I understand that what you're really great at is helping people build relationships with the C-suite. What type of relationships are those? Well, I, this this comes from really my experience as a communicator, but I think this also applies to people in, in other roles in, in organizations as well, whether it's legal, finance, HR, IT, uh, or, or sales, marketing, wherever you, wherever you are. And we as as we move forward in our career and we look to advance our functions within our within our organizations we're always looking to get that that proverbial seat at the table where we're there where uh, where decisions are being made and surrounded by peers and other leaders in the in the organization and we have a voice in the direction of our organization and that absolutely is is certainly a, a worthy goal and and that's something that that is that is definitely important to aspire to i like to take it a step further and say, instead, and yes, the seat at the table is great, but we also want that seat across the desk where we're having one-on-one -on -one meaningful conversations with the CEO or other members of the C-suite, not only about our area of expertise, but also as a trusted strategic advisor to that leader. So we are being seen as somebody who is a uh, not only good in in whatever our, our technical field is, but is also as a as a good business person who can contribute to the strategy and the growth of uh, of the organization. So that's where I think that um, that that we can really add add value individually. And I think there's some there are some I guess you can call them non traditional ways people that might not think are professional, but are ways to to go ahead and and do this and develop that relationship for yourself with those senior leaders and contribute to your organization in that high level. Mm. I think that's totally true because I, uh, one of my backgrounds is a uh, head of HR in the various industries and sector. And I was always the, the, the type of senior leader executive that I happen to have an expertise in HR, but I was foremost a business person. So that meant that I whether I might go into marketing and speak to the marketing director about a campaign, or I might happen to be looking at finance with finance talking about whether we should buy another, you know, uh, buy another company or whatever. And I was always recognized for my business knowledge and acumen. And the, it, I so happened to have an expertise in HR. And I think one that's one of the things that falls down, I think with senior teams or exec teams that don't work well is where everybody sort of stays within a specialism we've got without thinking as a collective group we need to know enough about what everybody's doing and what everyone's working for otherwise we can't help yeah exactly and so i'm 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 willing to i'm willing to bet that you you had some conversations where you're sitting across the table with whether it's the ceo or another c suite leader and you start you had the meeting to talk about some HR issue and you start talking about that and you get into it a little bit more. And as the conversation continues and goes on, you there comes a moment where you realize, wait a minute, we're not talking about HR anymore. We're talking about the business. And and that's where um uh, that's what always would energize me and mm -hmm. say, you know, I'm able to to leverage my expertise into something that can that is beyond just my technical level of of experience and and so um that's i i think that's a, a terrific goal to have uh, i always enjoyed it when i was able to get myself in those situations and i think there are some ways that you can do that that are that are a little bit non-traditional but um but are effective and are appreciated right well at the maverick paradox we love non-traditional <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what they are well, so I'll, I'll give you an example. So I, I had a, a a wonderful relationship with a CEO. Uh, I worked with him for about ten years. I was the head of communications in the organization, and and he was the he was the CEO. And uh, I, after about 
a little more than 10 years with the organization. I, I left for another opportunity. And as I was leaving, you know, they put together one of those little uh, keepsakes for you where they they have uh, they they have a picture and then all the people sign it around the corner of the picture and wishing you good luck and all of that. And the CEO signed it. And uh, with one of the funniest lines I've uh, I've ever heard kind of in a business setting, he said, uh, Gary, your wisdom and counsel were always valued and usually followed. <laughs> and <laughs> and that was a te- and that was a testament to kind of the relationship that that we had. And it it, it brought it down into into a nutshell where we were able to through what almost seems like informal interaction progress our relationship into something that was very valuable professionally. So what does that mean? So there are, I think there are a few different ways you can do this. When you, when you connect uniquely with, with a, uh, with a senior leader, uh, when you advise them differently than other people do. uh, And then also when you, when you act uh, in a, in a humble way with, with senior leaders, that will help you build relationships, distinguish and advance yourself in an organization as well, and then ultimately become that that trusted advisor. So what do I mean about connecting uniquely? The I think a big part of of what gets in the way of people having that uh, uh, that connection with with senior leaders is that sometimes people are 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 intimidated by them. They, uh, you know, they say, oh, you know, they 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 won't want to hear from somebody like me or they have so much power. I'm I'm too concerned to to get in front of them in a in a way that might even be a little bit vulnerable, um, but and or or tell them something they don't want to hear, for example. But I I have found that most senior executives, at least the good ones, appreciate that level of a little bit of a level of informal interaction, and that winds up getting you in the door for professional things. So, for example. CEO, a CEO or a senior leader, they they have weekends just like everybody else. They spend time doing family stuff or maybe they're relaxing. Now, they may be relaxing on their yacht or private jet and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and a little bit differently than than we might be. But but nevertheless, they are and they have that they have their own version of, of their of their weekends. But because some people are are so intimidated again and, and are afraid to approach these senior leaders, uh, they don't. The senior leaders don't have that opportunity, really, to talk about personal stuff that happens uh, off the clock, most like just like everybody else does in the organization. So, I've I've found that simply on a Monday, asking the CEO, "Hey, how was your weekend?" Uh, nobody asked the CEO, "How was your weekend?" But if you do, it's a turn. It's a perfectly innocent question, and it gets them talking about something they're excited with and uh, they're excited about. And all of a sudden, there's somebody they can. You're somebody they can speak with, and you've distinguished yourself from others in in the organization. Same goes with um, Joe. That- yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I think I think I love that because it's so true. And I remember being a senior leader. You kind of you want to have those relationships with people, but I think if you're do if the person is doing it to ingratiate themselves, then that's completely different. I mean, you have to genuinely want to know as opposed to can I get something out of this person if I ask this question? So I think the intention needs to be quite clear, I think. That's a great call out. Uh, absolutely. It has to be genuine. And the, the whole point of this is to is to have that authentic interaction. So we're coming off of that that full professionalism where we're using big words like leveraging paradigms and all that stuff. Um if we're if we're going to be interacting in an informal and authentic way, then yeah, we've got to be authentic about it. And so, if you're going to ask somebody how was your weekend, you want to be prepared to talk about your own weekend, and yeah. and actually listen, actively listen, not just listen to to respond. So, yeah, absolutely, that's a great call out. Yeah, let's listen to a quick advert. The Maverick Paradox. Judith Germain is an author, speaker, consultant, mentor and trainer, and the leading authority on Maverick leadership. She is the founder of the Maverick Paradox, which supports organizations to enhance their leadership capabilities and to help business owners develop and grow their businesses. 
Judith enables individuals, business owners, and organizations to improve their impact and influence. She is also HR Zone's leadership columnist, and her expert opinion has appeared in national, international and trade press. Welcome back to the Maverick Paradox. This is the podcast for the pathologically curious. I think I think what helps when you're saying about building relationships with the C-suite is that I mean, the higher up you become, the more, if you're not careful, the further away you are from the people that actually do the work, which is a dangerous scenario to be in. Mm-hmm. It's a case of that C-suite person needs to be able to reach out and become approachable but I think I don't know whether it's just my maverick nature but even when I first started work I was all we're all the same grade I never really kind of thought oh this person's super important so I better be worried about them I was never like that and I found that you know even when you're the the youngest person and the CEO is doing a walk around and you're talking to them like you know, obviously with respect, but like they're just somebody else. They treat you quite well because they admire the fact that you're just saying, so how's your day been? Do you have a great weekend? What have you been up to recently? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And nobody, but nobody else does it. (laughs) Nobody else does it. So, but, but to your point, you know, I'll give you an example. When, when I asked, when early in my career, I, I was afraid to talk to, to those folks like that. And it, it cost me. It it hurt me. There was a time where uh, the, this was in another company, a person uh, ahead of me or, or above me resigned and I wanted to move up into that position. And my immediate boss had recommended me for for it. But the president of the company said was 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 hedging on it, saying, oh, I don't know if Gary's the right person for for that job. And and that extended on for months and months and months. And I, I found out eventually that he didn't he he didn't think i had the 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 presence the, yeah. the ability to work with with senior leaders and there there was one day where i i was working late and i had to be, go to a meeting with the president and also like the number 2 guy in the company and it was like 6:30 in the evening and it was one of those things where you're just tired and you're you're you don't really um i guess I, 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 it's a time of day when I didn't overthink as much as I normally do. And I just, I was relaxed. I became relaxed in that, in that meeting and was joking around and all of that. And the meeting ended. And as we were walking out the door, the number two guy in the company kind of tapped me on my shoulder and said, you know, if you were like that in all of your other meetings, you would get the job. Yeah, I do. And- a lot. And that was that was the time when it was. I mean, it was crystal clear to me that oh, okay, I get it now. And that that was a huge piece of feedback for me. Yeah, I, I mean, I do a lot of work around that leadership presence, and I think people underestimate that. And I think also it's about if you want to build a good relationship with C suite, then you need to understand something that's much broader than your own function. You know, because I, I mean, I remember. Back in the day when I was in corporate, people would come to me for advice on their department, not the people in their department. Obviously, they would, you know, if it was a people issue. But if they were struggling or needed some insight in their own department, they would, I would talk to them. Because one, we were friends because you obviously have friendly relationships. But two, I could provide strategic insight. So I became known for, for things that's outside a role definition, like, you know, I will give honest advice. I, you know, I must I provide really great strategic insight and all that sort of stuff. And I guess that's what you were saying earlier, Reeves, that you, that you, if you want to build relationships, you need to be a person people want to build relationships with, and you, but you also need to be someone of value too. Absolutely. And I think one way to add value is to be the person that tells a leader uh, not necessarily always what they want to hear. Yeah, exactly. I've never and- had a- <laughs> right. And but but people well, but people are afraid to do that. And to your point, when you when a leader gets surrounded by yes people, then that that becomes a problem. Mm. Uh, but back to that back to that CEO that I had that that te- great 10 year, uh, 10 year working relationship with he he would at, at meetings of the top, say, 100 people in the in the company, he would stand up and point at me and say, Gary is the only person that tells me things I don't want to hear. Wow. And, and I need more of that. That's a and, huge yeah. And, and, you know, so I, I would tell, I would tell him things like, you know, Hey, I, 
I understand why you're thinking about doing X, Y, Z, but here are some implications for that, 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 you know, you, that you may want to consider, or I, I, again, I worked with him on communication. So I'd say, you know, here's, here's some better ways to, to do that interview. Um, but later, in, later on in my tenure with him, I, I would also provide him again, feedback that, that other people wouldn't. I mean, there was a particular case where another executive in the organization was just flat out being a bully. Mm. And it was a blind spot for the CEO. The CEO thought this guy was just fantastic. He saw him as being the future <laughs> leader of the company. And he just he just didn't see that. And I I sat down and and I said, you know, look, here's some of the stuff that he does. And it and it opened uh it opened the eye. Now I don't like <laughs> that kind of comes across like I was bad mouthing somebody. I I no, I don't like doing I don't like doing that, but I mean I saw some toxic behavior. Um, both directed toward me and and some others that I felt you know needed to be called out, but nobody would say anything to the CEO. So um, when you, when you do that, uh, you you are seen to your point as that as that person that's that's adding value. Now it doesn't mean that the person is always the this leader is always going to agree with with what you're saying, or um, or may um, uh, necessarily take what you what you're saying and 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 move on with exactly your your recommendation. There are times where uh they would be considering a a decision and I would say, well, you know, hey, let's think about these implications and they said, well, that's great, but I'm going to do it anyway. Mm. And and then they can because they're the CEO and it's and it's like, you know what? I I raised my hand, I provided my input and that's all I that's all I can do. And then, you know, I've got to be on board with whatever the leader and the organization decide to to do, but I was always grateful that I was able to to speak up and and say my piece. So there's a difference between being able to do that and always getting your way because you will never always get your way. And if you always got your way, you're in the wrong room. That's just terrible. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's like saying that you're always right, and that's that can't be the case. There's nobody no. right. No, so there's a so there's a difference. Just because you're you're speaking up doesn't mean that's the way it's going to go. You want to be able to be in that relationship and have that relationship where you can speak up, and then the chips fall where they may. So this is a good segue, actually, because I know that you're a communication expert. Now there is a way of communicating with the C-suite, isn't there? Tell us what you think about that. Well, there are there there are ways to communicate and build relationships. Like I was. I was talking about here. So asking about uh, things that other people won't ask about uh, using humor a little bit and and building those relationships. But also when you're in your, when you're it, it, there for a particular business reason, if you're making say a presentation or you're trying to advocate something or for something, or you're, you're, you're pitching something uh, it, it makes sense to, to think through uh, what the senior executives really, what their, what their environment is. And it all goes back to what one of my number one rules of communication is, is, uh, is know your audience. And so what is the, what, what's involved with the, with the C-suite audience? Well, they are, uh, they are, at least they're supposed to be thinking about very high level uh, strategic thoughts and not, not minutia. They are bombarded every day with a number of different requests, a number of different topics. They are usually moving in a bunch of different directions at the at the same time. Their calendars are usually full and and in some cases double and triple booked. Some of that's travel, some of it's it's meetings. And they're in a pretty highly visible uh, uh position as well. So everything they do is is being looked at and examined. They're reporting to the board if it's a uh, depending on the nature of the company, um they uh there there may be media attention on on what they're doing and and so forth. So you have to con so consider all of of that environment before you go in and you say okay, I'm going to I'm going to talk about what I need to talk about and and try to pitch and uh, what I'm what I'm pitching here. So what that means is, is when you go in into a situation like that, you want to get to the point quickly, have your ask up front, touch a little bit on on some of the evidence, but summarize again why it is that 
um, that you're asking for what you're asking for, what the business case of it is quickly and and leave it there and then open it for open it for questions and then have with you in your back pocket or as an appendix and a presentation, some backup in detail should the conversation go in that direction and you need that you need those proof points. But it all goes back to, again, just like you would communicate with anybody else, know your audience, know their perspective, know what they want from you, know what their frame of reference and their situation is and adjust your communication to that. So you're able to inform and persuade and influence in that particular audience the best you can. Brilliant. Thank you for that. I would um, also add is recognizing the style of the, of the person in front of you, you know, is that person someone who is, you know, more into the facts and figures are these people more into the teamwork and collaboration? What is it that, you know, what is that person's particular um, favourite way? So, for example, for me, I know that I prefer people just to come out with it. You know, just what is it? <laughs> just tell me. Don't kind of tiptoe up to the situation. to t- Just tell me as it is. Um, you know, I think there's there's knowing that and I also talk when I do um, when I'm mentoring people I talk about how senior leaders communicate quite differently from more junior leaders so junior leaders tend to give you the full story up until the issue so they've got an issue to discuss but they'll tell you everything and how they got to the point where they are <laughs> and, and not recognizing the senior leaders you know they don't have a lot of time so they want you to start with the problem potential solution and then if they and if they want to, they'll ask questions of how you got to where you got to. But they want yep. to start with the most important fact at the moment. Um, and I talk about that if you constantly talk from a more junior perspective, you will be seen as a more junior person because you're just not, you know, you're just not working. I think the other thing with a C-suite as well is knowing the right amount of deference to give while still remaining assertive and remaining, you know. So you're not kind of becoming sycophantic, but in your, you know, you're given a nod to the fact that yes, they are more senior than you, but you're not completely falling over on it. So you can say, you know what, there's no clothes on here. You know, you have no clothes. You're walking around naked. You know, this is the way it is. <laughs> you know, but you would, but but as you tell them that message, you you will give them the deference that they have earned through their dint of where they are. And I think people miss that too, don't they? So people can, senior team, team members can can subconsciously get annoyed because they, they're recognising on a subconscious level that you're not really respecting the position that they are by the way you're speaking to them. Yeah, there's a difference between confidence and arrogance, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So you, it's okay to go in and, and be confident in, in what you're saying. But if you go in as, well, I know better than you, uh, that's not going to fly <laughs> to your point. So, yeah. yeah. CEO. So a CEO may well accept somebody on the C-suite just walking in without an appointment because they, they value what they've got to say and they, they've earned it so much in a way. But that's not the same as having the most junior member of staff walking in without an appointment unless they've earned it in some other way. Right. So exactly. Like Exactly. Yeah. And then and, and then also I would just add, you know, to your to your point about uh, this a leader style in um it, it, what can help figure help you figure that out is thinking about their background. And this also go all goes back to to knowing your audience. So if somebody has moved up through say uh, a marketing discipline, they're probably more likely to be a more uh visual or creative learner. If somebody mm-hmm. moved up through finance, maybe they're more detailed oriented and uh and and care more about some of the, the the financial aspects of something. So yeah, to your point, uh, go, when you go back to, when you're considering somebody's style, it's, that's part of knowing the audience and thinking about what's their frame of reference? How are they thinking about this? So you can be as relevant and as timely as possible. Brilliant. Gary, before we end, is there anything you would like to leave the audience I, you know, I would just say again, with, with, uh, working with, with senior leaders, uh, don't, don't be intimidated, uh, show yeah. them the deference to your point, 
uh, th- that that's needed. And and frankly, depending on the leader, that's that can be um, that can be different for for each person. And mm-hmm. so you'll you'll have to kind of read the the situation. But um, you're because most people are intimidated and don't feel like they can have these kinds of conversations. If you do with a little bit of uh, a little bit of gumption, <laughs> uh, you'll you'll be you'll be able to to distinguish yourself. So I would suggest uh, take a deep breath and go for it. Brilliant. Thank you for coming on the show, Gary. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And thank you out there for tuning in to the Maverick Paradox podcast. I am Judith Germain, your host, and I hope you've enjoyed listening to today's conversation with Gary as much as I enjoyed having it. As a leader, you know that having a strong level of influence is essential to achieving your goals. But how do you know if you're truly making an impact? Take the How Influential Are You scorecard to get a clear picture of your current level of influence and identify areas for improvement. With personalised recommendations and valuable strategies, you'll be able to amplify your influence and make a real difference as a leader. Don't miss this opportunity to improve your leadership skills. Take the scorecard now at amplifyyourinfluence.scoreapp.com. (laughs) 